Forests are an interesting place. By day, they can feel magical and relaxing, the best way to enjoy nature and fresh air. By night, no matter where you are in the world, they can make you feel like you're in the Blair Witch Project. I'm so sorry. Even without urban legends like Bigfoot and Wendigos, forests and national parks are very mysterious places. It's estimated that there are currently between 80,000 to 90,000 people actively missing in North America, most of whom go missing in populated areas. Although this figure hasn't been confirmed or tracked by the National Institute of Justice, it's thought that about 1,600 of these cases occurred in national parks and publicly owned land. Most people who go missing turn up alive and well with a reasonable explanation for their disappearance, but sometimes, whether they're found dead, alive, or not at all, the circumstances surrounding their disappearances are completely baffling. Today, we're going to look at five cases of people who went missing in forests and national parks that will definitely give you chills. Joseph Keller. On July 23rd, 2015, Joseph Lloyd Keller went missing in the Rio Grande National Forest in southwestern Colorado. During the summer, Joseph had been on a road trip across the states with two friends, Colin Guatney and Christian Fetzner. They'd already traveled to Las Vegas, San Francisco, and the Grand Canyon before making their way to Rainbow Trout Ranch in Colorado, owned by Joseph's aunt and uncle. The Tennessee native was extremely active and had a passion for competitive running and open water swimming. He worked as a coach at a Tennessee swimming championship earlier that summer, and even though he dealt with asthma throughout his childhood, he was said to be very fit and very healthy. July 23rd was the day before Joseph's 19th birthday. He and Colin decided to go for an hour-long run through the Rio Grande National Park. A quarter of a mile into the run, they decided to split off onto different routes, which would get them to the designated meeting spot at the same time. However, when Colin finished his run, Joseph was nowhere to be found. Colin made his way back to the ranch and waited. By the time they were all getting ready to eat dinner and Joseph still wasn't back, they started to worry. He and Christian drove along the trail, honking their horn and shouting for Joseph, but he never answered them. After several weeks of the authorities searching far and wide, there was still no sign of Joseph, and they were forced to suspend the investigation. In January 2016, human remains were found about 100 miles from where Joseph went missing, but DNA determined they were not his remains. On July 6, just shy of a year after Joseph went missing, his remains were discovered at the bottom of a cliff by John Rienstra, a former defensive lineman for the Pittsburgh Steelers. An investigation concluded that Joseph had likely been trying to climb the cliff, lost his balance, and fallen, hitting his head on a rock, causing him to die of a fractured skull. The area had been searched at the time of his disappearance, but they had been a few hundred yards away from Joseph's body. Garrett Bardsley In August 2004, Garrett Bardsley was on a wilderness trip with his Boy Scout troop and his father, Kevin Bardsley, at Lake Cuberant in Utah. On the morning he vanished, Garrett and Kevin were fishing 150 yards away from the campsite when Garrett got his feet wet and decided to head back to the camp to change his shoes. Since the campsite was so close by and he'd been able to see Garrett for most of the way, Kevin felt comfortable letting his son walk back alone. He watched Garrett and shouted to him to keep on the correct trail so he wouldn't make a wrong turn. Fifteen minutes later, when Garrett still hasn't returned, Kevin walked back to the camp to see what was taking him so long. Chris Ivey, a family friend, was making breakfast for the troop and told Kevin that Garrett never made it back to the camp. An extensive search was carried out, but Garrett had never been seen again. The only thing they could find of him was a sock that he'd been wearing that day, half a mile from where he vanished. As there is no evidence of kidnapping, it's thought that Garrett got lost on his way back to the camp and died from exposure. He had no food or warm clothing, and despite it being summer, the temperature in the region was near freezing it would have been nearly impossible for him to have survived. However, according to Kevin and Chris, they deliberately chose their campsite for how easy it was to navigate, and how Garrett could have gotten lost is unexplainable to them. Even though the family has come to accept that Garrett is probably dead, they still hope that one day they will find him. The Cowden Family in 1974, the Cowden family traveled from White City, Oregon to the Siskiyou Mountains near the town of Copper, Oregon. Seven months later, their body was found seven miles away from their campsite, and their deaths remain unsolved to this day. Richard and Belinda Cowden loved to take their two children, David and Melissa, camping, and decided to take a trip to the Siskiyou Mountains on Labor Day weekend. 
The last live sighting of the family was on September 1st, when Richard and David visited a convenience store in Copper to buy milk before returning to camp. That evening, they were supposed to visit Belinda's mom at her home for dinner on their way home, since she lived close to the campsite. When they never arrived, Belinda's mom drove to the campsite to look for the family, but they were nowhere to be seen. According to her statement, the camp looked as though they'd simply vanished. All of their things were still there, including Richard's truck, so it would have been impossible for them to travel home. When police arrived at the camp to investigate, they described the scene as spooky. State and local police, along with the U.S. Forest Service, searched extensively for the family. Unfortunately, after six days, they were still nowhere to be found and the search was suspended. Family and friends continued to look for them during weekends and holidays. Seven months later, two gold prospectors were hiking near Carberry Creek when they discovered the human remains of an adult male tied to a tree. In a nearby cave, there were three more bodies. The bodies were identified as the Cowden family via dental records. Belinda and David had been shot, Melissa died from severe head trauma, and the cause of Richard's death remains a mystery. It's believed that as the family swam in the creek that morning, after Richard and David returned from the store, they were held at gunpoint and taken to the area where they died. The only known suspect in the case was Dwayne Lee Little, a known convict. Dwayne had a violent history and spent many years in prison, but was paroled just a few months before the Cowden's deaths. According to his then-girlfriend, Dwayne owned the same type of gun that killed Belinda and David. He was also known to be in Copper the same weekend as the Cowdens and may have been spotted with his parents by a woman camping with his family, who she said made her feel nervous. Dwayne's old cellmate, Floyd Forsberg, even claims that Dwayne confessed to the killings. Despite the amount of evidence, Dwayne was never charged and the case is still officially unsolved. However, in 1980, he was given three life sentences for an unrelated crime, so with any luck, he'll never get the opportunity to hurt another human being again. John Doe Our last case is by far the strangest one on this list, and actually involves two incidences that happened to a grandmother and her grandson on separate occasions in Mount Shasta, California. In October 2010, John Doe was camping with his parents at a popular fishing location near Mount Shasta. John Doe isn't his real name, however, the family chose to keep their identities private when their story was published in the Missing 411 book series. Between 6 and 6.30 p.m., his mother confined him and became worried. As he was only just able to walk and talk, his parents were concerned he'd wandered off by himself. Unable to find John themselves, his dad called the local authorities and alerted them to their missing son. An intense search was carried out on the area, and luckily, John was found a few hours later, confused but unharmed. However, authorities were confused. They'd already searched that area a dozen times over the past few hours. Where had he been all that time before he turned up? John was taken to the hospital for a checkover, but the doctor said he was totally fine to go home. As the weeks passed, the family tried to move past their strange, terrifying experience. One day, John was with his grandmother, Kathy, who he called Cappy, when he told her something strange. He said to her, I don't like the other Cappy. When she asked what he was talking about, John gave her his version of the events that happened on the night he went missing. While in the camp, he claims he saw Cappy in the woods waving and motioning him to go to her, which he did. She took him to a cave that was filled with spiders, broken human robots, purses, and various weapons, including guns. He said that then, Cappy's head started glowing and he realized she wasn't the real Cappy. She started asking John strange questions and told him that he'd been planted in his mom's womb by aliens and he was actually from outer space. Eventually, the fake Cappy took him back out of the cave and told him to wait for help and he was found a few minutes later. Concerned by the story, Cappy told her son, John's dad, what she told him. Little John had already relayed the story to his parents, who just dismissed it as an overactive imagination and too much television. However, Cappy had a story of her own to share. A year before her grandson went missing, Kathy and a friend were camping close by to where her family stayed near Mount Shasta. One morning, she woke up face down in the dirt and had somehow gotten out of her sleeping bag during the night. Already confused, when Kathy sat up, she felt a horrible pain in the back of her neck. Both her and her friend had puncture marks that they thought must have been from a spider bite. As the morning went on, Kathy started to feel really sick and tried her best to recall what happened the night before. All she could remember as she fell asleep were several pairs of glowing eyes watching her from the darkness, but she thought it was just a herd of deer. 
It took several months for Kathy to feel like her old self again. She reported feeling emotionally and creatively drained after the strange ordeal. She says she probably would have just brushed it off as an unhappy accident if John hadn't told her about his experience at Mount Shasta. That brings us to the end of today's video. What did you think of our list? Have you ever had a strange, creepy experience in a forest? Let us know in the comments section down below. Thank you for watching the video and don't forget to like and subscribe to stay up to date with all the videos coming your way soon.